I have two special guests here today, and you're going to enjoy what they've got to say. Dr. Ross, glad to have you with us today. It's always a Thank privilege. You. Dr. Rana, right. it's a privilege and a pleasure to have both of you here today. Thank you. And today we're going to talk about footprints in the sand, evidence for the great Creator God, and we're glad to have you with us. Um, I want to talk about Darwin. Darwin talked about the transitional life forms. I think he used the term, if my memory is working well today, in his book, Origin of Species, I think he spoke about the emerge or the discovery of innumerable. I think that was the word, innumerable. That's right. Missing links that would be found because if those missing links were not found, if they didn't exist, it would mean that the whole idea of evolution was somehow fatally flawed. Um, have they found them? No, they, they haven't. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, Darwin, when he wrote The Origin of the Species, actually mm. devoted a couple of chapters to objections to his theory, where he raised objections to his own theory. So he was pretty honest as a, yes. as a scientist. He was groping for light, wasn't he? He was. And he, he pointed out that the fossil record at, known in his day just simply didn't match what you'd expect if his theory was valid. Mm. As you said, he expected innumerable mm. transitional mm. forms. But he said, they're that, going to be found. We haven't found them yet because we haven't had enough time. Right. The fossil record's incomplete, mm. which was mm. a legitimate uh, rationale in his day because paleontology was in its infancy. Yes. But here we are 150 plus years yes, later, yes, and the fossil time. record still looks the same as it did in Darwin's day. An, an absence or a near absence of anything that could be considered genuinely a mm. transitional form. Mm. And we see sudden appearances. Every time there's innovation yes. in life's history, it happens explosively without any kind of evolutionary history preceding mm. it. Mm. And so we see sudden appearances mm. and, and an absence of evolutionary change. Mm. The pattern of the fossil record doesn't match Hmm. Darwin's expectations. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Ross, I'm going to read you a, a statement and I'd like you to comment on it. This is from Dr. Ian Tattersall, the curator of human evolution at the American Museum of Natural History. He says, if the transformational notion were accurate, histories of continuity should clearly show up in the structures of the paleontological record. Yet if the truth be told, the fossils themselves had never really borne out this expectation. Indeed, Darwin himself had been well aware that the record was rife with discontinuities. He had, however, explained away this awkward fact with the now familiar claim that the expected intermediaries had simply not yet been discovered. In Darwin's day, with a much more limited record than we have now, this was at least a tenable position. But as the doctor here has said, we're 150 years down the road. But well over 100 years and many millions of fossils later, the essential picture has not changed at all, quoted from his book, The Monkey in the Mirror. It's a good right. title, isn't it? <laughs> um, would you comment on that? Well, we now have an understanding why the fossil record looks that way. Mm. Uh, thanks to astronomy, we realize there will be frequent interruptions of life here on planet Earth. We call them mass extinction events, mm. where a supernova explodes or a meteor collides with the Earth, mm. or there's some kind of climate catastrophe that's initiated by an astronomical event. But we see in the fossil record, every mass extinction event is followed by a mass speciation event. And the mass speciation event happens quickly after the mass extinction event. It also happens where the species of life show up on the terrestrial scene with optimized ecologies. There's no developmental time in the optimization of the ecology. It's there right away. And it's exactly what you'd expect from a creator god of the Bible. It tells us in Psalm 104, it's a property of all life to die off, but God recreates and renews the face of the earth. And from an astronomer's perspective, that's exactly what we'd expect. So now from the viewpoint of a biologist, uh, how do you see all of this working together? 
Now, the evolutionary process, as we all know, is that you go back to, to non-life. And then over billions of years, you have the simple becoming the complex. How do you feel yourself about the, the theory of Darwinian or neo-Darwinian theory? Well, I'm highly skeptical of, of the evolutionary mm. paradigm, the idea that life can come from non-life, that life can create itself, if you will. Mm. I'm highly skeptical of the idea that once you have life present on the planet, mm. that uh, one major group can generate another major group, that innovation is possible through this evolutionary mechanism. Mm. It doesn't mean that there's no evolution at all. There's mm. a phenomena called microevolution, yes. where species adapt that, uh, to that their environment. All Christians believe in. Right, uh, right, and and, mm. and so <clears throat> we're not rejecting this idea that there's limited evolution, but to say that evolution can explain the origin of life and the history of life on Earth, I'm highly skeptical of that yes, idea. Yes, yes, because the evidence doesn't seem to point to it. And it, and um, yeah, my skepticism is driven by the science, yes. not my commitment to what Scripture says. No, no. Then Darwin made some other interesting comments. He, he pondered the problem of the trustworthiness of the human mind. Now, his argument basically was this. If this thing between our ears is the product of blind chance, if, it, if we are the product of time plus matter plus chance, then how can we trust it? Yeah. I think Darwin, again, was mm. very honest about the, the potential objections to his theory and the problems mm. with his theory. And this, to me, is, is what is self-refuting, if you will, about Darwinism. Mm. And, that, and you, you brought that point up, is that if our mind evolved, then our mind is not about discovering truth or what's real about the world. It's simply giving us a, some kind of framework that allows us to survive. So what we learn may not be true. It just may be suitable enough uh -huh. for us to survive. Hmm. If that's the case, then how do we know that Darwin's theory is valid? Of course. Or how do we know that yes. anything is valid? How can you test anything? It, it, it hmm. completely undermines the, hmm. the capacity of human beings to have uh, the, the ability to discover truth. So if a person is going to cling to evolution, he's got to be prepared to uh, look at this terrible doubt. And this terrible doubt throws everything in doubt, doesn't it? It does. If you believe that things came from nothing. And this is the power of the Christian faith, mm. is that because we take what Scripture tells us, that we are made in God's image, it means that we have this capacity coming from a creator who yes. cannot yes. lie. Yeah. We have this capacity to discover that which is true, mm. and that we can be confident that our conclusions have truth if we've done our homework appropriately. And, and this is very different, again, than an, an evolutionary framework or an, an atheistic framework. Mm. And in fact, this is what makes science itself possible, ironically, mm. Mm. is to believe that we have the, the facilities to discover that which is true about the universe. Mm. And so, in a sense, Darwin is not only undermining his own theory, he's yes. undermining science itself. Uh, I have a, a statement here from the great professor Leakey. He said, if pressed about man's ancestry... I would have to unequivocally say that all we have is a huge question mark. To date, there has been found nothing to uh, truthfully purport as a transitional species to man, including Lucy. If further pressed, I would have to state that there is more evidence to suggest an abrupt arrival of man rather than a gradual process of... Uh, evolution. So the great Leakey who found uh, our so-called human ancestor Lucy in Africa, he says, when I said that she was our origi uh, originator or she was one of our common ancestors, he says, I was wrong. And the, he said, the big problem is now for us is that the human race, it appears, arrive suddenly. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is he's right. I mean, when you, so look, at, right. <clears throat> when you look at the, yes. the fossil record, there's clearly yeah. a fossil record of these creatures called mm. hominids. Mm. But nobody knows how the hominids relate to each other in an no. evolutionary sense yeah. or which of them could be part of the human 
evolutionary, evolutionary lineage. In fact, many of the key cast of characters that are presented to us in biology textbooks when it comes to human evolution, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, mm. Homo habilis, Lucy, the Tong child, mm. and the list goes on and on and on, are all considered to be evolutionary side branches and dead ends and are no longer considered to be part mm. of the human pathway. Mm. It, it, and so nobody can tell you how human evolution happened. So why would we think that it happened if we don't know how it happened? It makes you think that this book just may be true. <laughs> and uh, when we come back, I'm going to ask you the question, was there an Adam and was there an Eve? And we'll be back after this message. The Carter Report is a self-supporting ministry with a global mission. We believe that the most important thing that we can do in this tremendous hour is to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We do not believe that this is business as usual. We believe that we are living in the closing hours in the history of this world. Bless your heart, friend. Look at the signs that are being fulfilled almost every day. The signs of the times are shouting at us and they're saying, Jesus is coming soon. I want you to be my partner in global mission. I want you to be my partner in helping to tell the world about the coming of Jesus. I want you to be my partner in the preaching of the distinctive truths of the three angels' messages. Please check us out at the new Carter Report website, carterreport.org. We have a special section whereby you can ask questions and I will give you the answers from the living word of the living God. That is the carterreport.org. My friend, we want you to join us in the mission to preach the gospel in China, in India, in Australia, in Africa, in the United States of America, wherever people are lost and wherever people need to hear the good news that Jesus saves. Please check us out. The new Carter Report website, carterreport.org. I want to hear from you today. Welcome back to the program. We're talking about the origin of the human race, evidence for the Creator. My guests are Dr. Hugh Ross and Dr. Faz Rana. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Was there an Adam and Eve? The Bible says, but we're talking, trying to find evidence today to, to say to people, look, there, there is credible evidence in the scientific world why we can trust the Bible. Was there an Adam and Eve? Uh, this is something that is absolutely mind-boggling, that evolutionary biologists who are trying to explain the origin of humanity mm. through evolutionary means have unwittingly uncovered evidence for the historicity of Adam and Eve as being the progenitors of all humanity. And what these scientists are doing is they're looking at genetic variability of people around the world and from that genetic variability, you can infer the very early history of humanity. And it looks as if humanity had a recent origin in a single location close to where we think the Garden of Eden would have been. Who believes this? This is, this is the scientific data. So whether one is an evolutionary biologist or what have you, this is what the data says. Mm. Humanity originates recently, a single location close to where we think the Garden of Eden would have been. Mm. from a very small population of individuals and using a special type of genetic marker called mitochondrial DNA, you can literally trace the origin of every person on this planet back to a single sequence of DNA, this is, which this is called mitochondrial Eve in the scientific literature. And the same thing is true for Y chromosomal DNA, which reflects uh, the paternal lineage of humanity. Every man on the planet can trace an origin back to a single ancestral sequence of Y chromosomal DNA called Y chromosome Adam, which I would take as the biblical Adam and the biblical Eve, that there is 
scientific evidence for a recent origin of humanity from a primordial So bear. there are solid scientific reasons why we can believe. Well, the scientific literature is now compelled to use biblical terminology to describe their discoveries. Mm, this sort of blows the mind, doesn't it? Yeah, it's referred to as a Garden of Eden mm. hypothesis, and they talk about this Y chromosome atom and mitochondrial DNA <laughs> Eve, and they're talking about dates that are consistent with the biblical date for the origin of uh, Adam and Eve. Is truth discovered in a vacuum? No, people have philosophical mm -hmm. presuppositions they're bringing to the table. All the time. People have had life experiences. I find many people who are atheists re using science as an intellectual excuse yes. to reject the faith, but there's mm. other issues at play. Oftentimes they're angry at God yes. or they're angry at Christian Christians or Christianity. They've been hurt mm. by Christians or they've been... Uh, abused by Christians yeah, or... Yeah, abused or, by some pedophile in the church. Yeah. Therefore, they say God doesn't exist. I would argue that the passion of the atheist argues for God because if there really is no God, they should be treating the existence of God like they would the tooth fairy. Yes, of course. But the fact that they're mm. so passionate against yes. the existence of God tells yes. me mm. they believe he exists, but they don't like him. So truth is not discovered in a, in a vacuum... Is it not true that the great Darwin basically went down the road to unbelief because of the death of a daughter? Yeah. Uh, his, he, he was in an Anglican family, you know, the Church of England, and um, there was some time when he was even very much interested in theology. He studied to be uh, a uh, minister. Yes, yes, to be an Anglican priest. But he prayed earnestly that his daughter would be okay. But she wasn't okay. And this led to the terrible doubt, what, what can God be like if my daughter dies? And so I've discovered in my experience as a pastor for many, many years now that truth is not done in a vacuum. People reach theological ideas as well, as well as scientific ideas, because of what's happened to them, because of their background. And uh, we were talking during the break about a, a scientist who shall remain anonymous, who was abused in his church by a pedophile. And since that time, his thinking has been beyond uh, being an agnostic, but a, a militant atheist and whenever he talks, he talks about the bad things that Christians have done. He doesn't talk about the bad things that atheists have done. But it makes you think that a lot of his thinking, he takes the facts that you and I talk about, but he turns them to, to somehow fit in with the hurt that he's gone through. Yeah. Have you found this? Yeah, that's true. And, mm. and along those lines, when you make an argument for design, yes. many times people will point out what they claim to be bad designs in yes. nature yes. and try to use this as a, a way to undermine the design mm. argument. Mm. And, but in, in a sense, it's kind of a, an embodiment of this, this very issue that we're talking about yes. is that people see God as somehow have, having disappointed him. Yes. And they see bad things mm -hmm. as opposed to, to mm -hmm. God's glory when you look at So there's a nature. lot of anger there. Yes. And, and there's also mm. the opportunity to put it to the test. Mm. They're saying, hey, this is a bad design in nature. Mm. Let's study it in more depth. Every time we've done that as scientists, what we thought was a bad design turned into a very elegant design. It's a great way to learn things you don't already know. And so, again, I mean, let's put our atheistic belief to the test and see. If your atheism is right, then more scientific research will give you more mm. evidence for your belief. Mm. But if the Christian view is right, yes. more understanding is going to increase the evidence for the Christian faith. So let's get back. Tell me more as a biologist. Tell me more about um, evidence for the human race. Now, this sort of ca captures my imagination. I'm astounded that... He, the Bible says the human race appeared suddenly upon the human scene. Yeah. It wasn't a long, drawn-out evolutionary process. They, they came in a certain place that was called the Garden of Eden, and we can somewhat get an idea of where that is. Um, 
they didn't appear as human beings uh, seven billion million years ago. They certainly were not related to Lucy. <laughs> Give me more evidence that there was an abrupt beginning for the human race. Well, an another uh, way to think about this has to do with the concept of the image of God. Yes. You know, we're made in God's image, yes. and, and we're uniquely made in God's image mm. according to Scripture. Mm. And what's interesting is when humans show up on the scene, there's what's called the sociocultural Big Bang, the human revolution, mm -hmm. the Great Leap Forward. These are different ways it's described, where suddenly yes. you have these creatures that are behaving unlike anything else that has ever existed on the planet, including Neanderthals, including Lucy, including Homo erectus and Homo habilis. Mm. You have creatures capable of symbolism, creatures capable of making art and music, language, mm -hmm. advanced, sophisticated societies emerge. Mm -hmm. This is evidence, I believe, that human beings bear God's image, and the, the fact that it shows up suddenly and coincidentally with humans, again, is consistent with what you'd expect from Scripture. Uh, even, even evolutionary biologists studying human origins acknowledge that humans seem to stand distinct, that we're unique in, in, in these special ways that I think finds explanation in what the biblical text tells us. And so we've taken quite a journey. We've gone from astronomy down to the cell. Uh, out, in, out in the stars, we see amazing balance, complexity, uh, the odds of it all happening, one in so many, many trillions. Uh, we've talked about the complexity of a single cell, the utter impossibility of a single cell making itself. There seems to be an overwhelming evidence that we should believe in God and believe in the Bible. And you, and you men do, don't you? Yes, we do. And you believe in the Creator and you trust in God. How do you explain the genetic similarity between humans and chimpanzees? Well, I think the Bible gives us a clue. Uh, it tells us that Adam was made from the dust of the earth and that yes. God breathed the breath of life yes. into him. Yes. Genesis 2.19 says mm. the animals were made from the mm. dust of the earth as well. Mm. And so that tells us that we're made out of the same stuff yes. as, as the other creatures. So mm -hmm. you would expect there to be biological similarities. There have to be. But what's also interesting is it also tells us that humans uniquely received the divine breath. Yes. I think that omission is mm. intentional. Mm. We're made in God's image. Yes. And so what distinguishes us from other creatures isn't our biology, but rather it's our spiritual makeup, yes. the fact that we bear God's image. Yeah, and we have the capacity to worship. Yeah, and so the mm. genetic similarity just simply reflects the fact mm. we're made out of the same building blocks. Now, what I've discovered is this, that the... Uh, the chance of life, and now talking from the viewpoint of ev uh, evolutionists, which I'm not, but an evolutionist says that life has got to arrive, uh, arrive and get going and thrive in a very short period of time on this planet. Even if it's 100 million years in the evolutionary cycle, that's not even a watch in the night. Yes. It's so, it's so very quick, isn't it? And so... You have these arguments from the evolutionists, but, and because of those arguments, there is a new theory that we've talked about before. It's called transpermia. Is that right? What does it mean? Yeah, it's panspermia. Oh, panspermia. Yeah, it's the idea. I've added to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's transpermia in the sense that they're saying that uh, there's dust that's come to us from other planets. Yes, yes. And embedded in that dust are either bacteria or the crucial building blocks like the sugars and the, mm -hmm. the DNA and the RNA. Is this not an argument of desperation? It is an argument of desperation. It's an argument that's basically been refuted in the scientific literature because we now can determine, number one, that that dust cannot travel across interstellar space hmm. without being so thoroughly destroyed as to be useless in the origin of life paradigm. But it's basically showing that, one, from a naturalistic perspective, we can't explain the origin of life on the Earth. We can't explain any solar system bodies. Mm -hmm. It can't come from another planetary system. Hmm. It can't come from a, a cosmic dust. Mm -hmm. you know, we were at an origin of life research conference mm -hmm. where a gentleman came to the microphone and said, we've ruled out all possible explanations for the origin of life except one. Hmm. 
Aliens came here in spaceships and brought life here to planet Earth yeah. 3.8 billion years ago. And these people laugh at Christians. Pardon me? They laugh at Christians. They do, but I, we were kind of at that conference saying, mm. I said to Fuzz, he's getting close to the right answer. Yes, I know. It, it is an alien, it yeah. is intelligent, yeah, yeah. but it's a being from beyond matter, energy, space, and time. Yeah. So, can we agree today, and I'm sure we do, that we can trust the Bible? Yes. Mm. And we can trust in God, mm -hmm. yeah. because He made us in His own image. And the great truths of the Bible are in harmony with the best discoveries of science. Yes. Right. Whether it is in biology that you rightly represent or, or in astronomy that you rightly represent. And so we would have a message to the people watching today, whether they're young or old, whether they've, uh, they go to university, they don't go to university. You can believe in God and you can believe in the Bible. There are, there's a million reasons why you can believe. And the God who made you loves you. And he gave his son Jesus.